Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show, episode number 307, with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. This is number 307. We're getting up there in the numbers, isn't it? Bit by bit, little by little, creeping up towards the 10s and the 20s and etc, etc, slowly and surely until we get to the milestone which is 500 and that will be a really good milestone to maybe celebrate maybe you know have a little toast of you know whiskey or beer or a toke and a cigarette or something i don't know there might be some kind of celebration that way but until then we just continue on let me move this a little bit closer in because it's a bit far but yeah how's it how's everything going good pretty well on this end um for the most part i think the Rain did a good job of washing out all the enthusiastic members of the public who thought it was a good idea to head out and try and catch the last bits of sunshine before it disappears. Because you know, rightly or wrongly, you know, knowing our luck and how terrible it's been, you know what's going to happen. It's going to be absolutely disgusting for the next couple of weeks or next few weeks, and then it will just brighten up just as we're about to start heading outside again. So, um, don't if you are counting on going outside and getting some you know bronzer applied to your legs or you're intending to get a bit of tan on your shoulders definitely do it in the next couple of weeks because i've got a feeling that weather's gonna turn again i've got no proof i don't know i don't really read the weather and shit the weather to me is sort of like people that believe in astrology sometimes it's a bit weird in it when people are obsessed with reading weather apps and stuff but <laughs> no i'm joking obviously it's not the same as astrology astrology is a whole bunch of bullshit but yeah no one's outside man really really good I that was helpful for me in terms of running I don't have to be, you know, excusing people out of the way or... No, actually, no, I don't do that anyway now because no one talks to anybody outside, innit? No one wants to have any kind of conversation with you unless it's somebody in a shop. People try and keep their distance. They don't want any, any kind of, you know, saliva particles making their way across their face, slowly dripping into their eyelids, and then suddenly they start shaking or trembling. I'm not sure what actually happens when you get corona. Do you actually shake or do you just start coughing? I don't know. But either way, no one wants that, so people are keeping away from each other. But again, the rain did a good job of curtailing any kind of effort to go outside, which is great. So hopefully this continues, especially during the peak months or the peak times. And then when it starts to level out a bit, if the sun's come back, people want to go out and risk it, then fair enough. I think, um, as I mentioned previously with yesterday's video, I've been reading a lot of this stuff that's going on in the States, you know. There are a lot of, there's all these protests, uh especially in the states where they haven't really been hit as hard because some of the numbers in new york compared to la just don't make any sense really it doesn't really add, i don't really understand why one side of, the, of america has been hit really hard and the other side hasn't especially when you consider but they but of course i understand you know there's a lot of distance in between both um you know america's you know who has a huge land mass i'm assuming but and maybe some of the travel was stopped interstate that maybe helped it but some of the numbers i think the number i don't know it's like 10 times the deaths in new york than it is in la for the most part i think so i think new york is like in the 12 that i looked at last and la is like 1000 mark so again i'm not too sure it's because you know la happens to be there's a huge population of people that live there who are very affluent who might have access to medical supplies or testing or whatever it may be or it's the fact that most people in new york but then New York would have a lot of affluent people there too, wouldn't you? Or maybe a lot of the affluent people that live in New York went upstate or they went down south somewhere. I don't know really, but it just doesn't make any sense. So, but the debate is interesting regardless. Hearing people you know, from the States talk about why they think stuff should reopen it kind of makes you think maybe there is a, there is a scenario. Maybe there is a scenario because I remember seeing this doctor talk about it where there is a scenario where some states could argue that lockdowns were a bit heavy-handed, right? Maybe lockdowns only apply when you are at death's door and people are just dropping like flies everywhere. You need to, you know, refrain from, you need to make sure that people stay in so it doesn't spread as fast as it can. But when it's a few cases, it might not be smart to lock everyone down. It might be smart to kind of phase it out, but then that requires adequate testing and that requires preparation that requires resources and what i think has happened is that the places where they haven't had the resources or the preparation or the timing they're the ones that were heavy you know they smacked the like lockdown hammer really hard and fast because they had no way to deal with it that was the only viable option available on the table right um it's similar when you watch those um 
uh, those crime shows, right? Or those kind of anti-terrorist movies, or those kind of terrorist, you know, we're going to beat terrorism movies, right? And then someone runs into the door and's like, oh, I've got the idea. we got to do this, to do this, to do that. And then everyone in the room just goes with it because no one's just got anything. They've all been run dry, right? They've tried all their plans and it's just not, it's not worked. So when you run in with any kind of half-baked, sensible seeming idea people just latch onto it because they just want some solution out of the misery that they're going through so maybe this is what's going on now with the lockdowns in some states maybe some people are like you know what i don't know what we're gonna do so let me just do this because everyone else is doing it and i won't get blamed for not doing nothing at least that's what people are probably thinking because you know politicians are um a selfish bunch right um they're they're not a little bit they're entirely self-centered they're just worrying about making sure that they're able to get reelected um, next time around, or they want to, people to remember them. And they want they want to have good sentiment, right? You want to be, have your poll numbers looking good. You want people to think of you in a positive light. For the most part, I think there's some politicians that don't actually care, but most of them do care what people think of them. So they're probably like, you know what? Let me just go with this option instead of looking at the numbers and analyzing it correctly. And then now you're in an issue where, for the most part, most governments in the UK is the same. It's easy to lock something down, but to start it back up again in a sensible way with some kind of, you know, sensible discussions is really difficult because now it's a political thing, isn't it? You're seeing people on the right who are more, let's say, uh, cons- uh, conspiratorial, but they're a little bit, you know, they question everything for the most part. They're not that much, which is interesting because you would have thought the Democrats would be more questioning government right they would have been the ones that are a little bit more libertarian in their ways they would not want too much government oversight they wouldn't want people kind of enforcing rules and arresting mums and parks you'd think so isn't it it's like it lacks humanity but actually it's the people on the right who are like you know what this is nuts like you should be able to decide and, and i think a lot of them have been quite clear in that in that they don't mind they don't mind risking their lives if if it means they can go back to work they were there because they don't expect much in it we have the nhs they don't really expect to get looked after looked after by their government right they're more worried about their guns getting taken away than they are worried about expecting you know checks in the mail that stuff is a pleasant surprise i think for most americans they don't ever get any handouts food tokens are quite hard to come by uh benefits aren't what they are in other countries so when they are told to stay in for an unspecified timeline unspecified amount of time they're not big they're not really given any kind of indication when it's going to be over there's no collective consensus as to what's happened how to stop it um or how to kind of alleviate some of the issues or you know there's no one really talking about it in a clear sensible way it just becomes nuts so now the politicians are worried because political issue they're not well worried about every move they make is gonna either push them further to the right or further to the left which is not in it really looking at how the world is transformed into this place where any kind of any you know any disaster that happens is regardless of where it happens regardless of how it happens is going to get turned into some sort of political uh, talking point or battleground regardless whether it's in europe whether it's in southeast asia whether it's in africa whether it's in the states whether it's in north america central america south america the way the world is now at the moment it just there's no way of dealing with things in just a clear rational humanistic way right where you're trying to make sure you're inflicting the less possible damage on people or on your population or on your you know constituents on your citizens you want to make sure you know they just have they're, they're okay no one's thinking about that everyone's just thinking about how can i get out of this without incurring the most amount of damage during this whole debacle because no one wants no one wants to come out of this being regarded as like the dummy like um who's that guy was it plume pluma daniel is it plumber pluma bruma do you remember the dude from when the whole Afghanistan war was happening and he took over, he was one of the lead guys and he was blamed for essentially changing how they classified Afghanistan soldiers or something. I forgot what it was, but he was um, inadvertently responsible for the uprising in resistance in Afghanistan because he essentially took away all the benefits that these ex-soldiers had, other they were leading on and kind of gave the 
people on the ground no leverage in terms of how they can negotiate just the whole clusterfuck right he was like the guy in head office or yeah the one with a suit and tie on or the one with actual gun in his hand no one wants to be that guy right no one wants to be blamed for anything inadvertently you want to just be the one providing solutions but the solutions right now are really 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 difficult to enact especially if you're somebody that doesn't really have much of a moral backbone you don't have much character there's nothing really defining who you are you just kind of go with the wind so you get voted next so it's not the best time to be a politician right now they'll tell you that much and then while on the subject of that there was actually a really cool interesting article regarding the whole issue with football at the moment in the premier league i think we're in a position where well so far we have the league on uh, his, his fish is officially cancelled right league on league two Ligue 1, Ligue 2, sorry, is maybe cancelled. No, Eredivisie is the Dutch league is effectively cancelled due to the fact that they won't be able to host events for people, you know, up and, uh, I think after September. So they've effectively made that league null and void and that's going to just, you know, go where it's going to go because there's clubs complaining about how it was dealt and people can get fined, but that's officially done. Ligue 1, Ligue 2 will definitely get finished because um, I think... Um, uh their guy macron whatever his name is right is it macron um he just he declared that there were not going to be any sort of large-scale events with more people blah, blah blah in the same sort of vein and now it's left up to the bundesliga and i guess the maybe the Serie A is the same but mostly the bundesliga and the premier league to kind of make the next move but of course no one in premier league wants to do that because they're afraid of uh setting up a series of events that's going to lead to a lot of people getting fined but I thought Gary Neville made a really good point regarding the whole issue so on Sky Sports. I'll read a little bit of it now, but then let me actually get what he actually said. But I think Gary Neville made a really good point regarding it all. If I can get up on the screen for you guys to see. Um, speaking about why exactly we're in a situation we're in now, but I think I mentioned it pri privately, but I'm not really convinced there's going to be... I'm not really convinced the Premier League have actually uh, thought of a scenario where some players will refuse to play number one because they're you know they're like me and you right they have access to the internet they're reading the news they probably have maybe a couple of people on, on the inside working in hospitals nurses doctors who are also giving them some information i don't know whatever they just you know they are they're living in this moment the same as we are there's no guarantee that these people with families with brands to look after right are going to necessarily be that comfortable um putting themselves back on the front line to play football for no fans um with especially with the uncertainty around the tracing and the testing and just general health and safety this is not going to do it and i think the premier league are making all these plans about how they're going to restart things without actually consulting the people who are probably second to players who are the most important you know second to fans i say who are the most important which are the players um and guy never sort of touches on it saying that you know they need to make some sort of decision sooner or later. It's a tweet from Sky Sports. I'll play it for you just now so you can hear it. Boom. I think it's very difficult to pick up the league if you go as far into September because of the contract situations uh, with regards to the players that are at the existing clubs. So you've got you know lots of players that are out of contract all across Europe that ultimately, I think maybe an extra month would be palatable, but the idea of going into August and September <laughs> is something that I think will be very difficult to implement. And you're right, I, the government in France have stepped in. Our government at this moment in time, I saw uh, the test in the water, typical of what our government do. They test the water over the last few days to see whether football can return, whether it's palatable to the fans, to the, to the public. You know, these four million pounds worth of tests that the Premier League is buying will accept it. So they drip feed a bit in each day, as do the Premier League. They test the water, see what the sort of feeling is, and then they'll make a decision off the back of that. The reality of it is, I think that the Premier League will probably wait for the Bundesliga to see how they go, and then they'll react off that. But I keep coming back to the. We will be in the stadiums, Kelly. We're we'll looking at the games and we'll be commentating on them. But the minute one player, one member of staff goes into intensive care, what are they going to do? What are they going to do? And that's the bit that's on this shoulder telling them to risk, to risk. And they're not sure. They're not sure. They really are not sure at this moment in time how to deal with it. And that's. And that is how it should be, really. I, I think 
the level of um, hesitation that you have towards putting things on is make, makes a lot of sense i guess there's a lot of money on the line there's a lot of jobs on the line too if you get it wrong reputational damage is going to be irreversible you know the premier league doesn't have the best reputation in terms of making decisions in terms of leading the you know the in terms of kind of pushing things forward um they're kind of slow to react on a lot of things they sort of do hide behind the premier league the league officials referees association stuff that's going on with var there's a lot of issues um even the kick it out kick it out football the anti-racism campaign hasn't really been dealt with the right way so you get the feeling they are waiting for the government to make a decision but that's not going to happen either because the government are also very aware that their sentiment isn't the best at the moment right Boris just announced he's having a baby and people are already piling onto him regard you know what i mean like this guy can't get any kind of breaks so imagine the premier league so i think the only option on the table now would be just avoid it and just carry on again next season however however it may however the chips may fall whoever gets affected gets affected but just deal with it that way i think all this time wasted trying to work out these solutions where you have people playing in the england you know training facility and you have people hold up in the hotels it's just not viable like how long is it going to take their players to be physically fit to play football in the first place it just doesn't make any sense really i don't really know what they attempt what they intend to get out of it it's going to probably cause a lot more damage than good and i think um Julian Lopetegui I think it makes if I got it here Lopetegui Lopetegui how do you spell his name Lopetegui Seville manager he made a really good point about it Seville manager oh that marker right was that marker Lopetegui uh what's it how do you spell his name logo yeah so uh, Lopetegui made a really good point former Madrid manager and Spanish manager and manager of Seville about what's required in order to get the players back to you know the level of fitness needed in order to play football behind closed doors even right or just competitive football in any way shape or form and I didn't actually know this so this is the point that he made here from this is from a marker article so if I can get the point up here da, 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 do you think it's an alternate call um, so here he goes right let's see if I can find it but um, load up is from marker so this is the following um do you think they are nervous about returning to the or scared to begin effectively he said yeah let take it here he says all the players are worried about returning we want to return to play but there is a, this there is a concern over how in what we way and how in what way we have to trust the good practice of sports establishments and the ministry of health the main people responsible who have no guarantee the health of all our players Aside from that, it is a preparation time that we need at least five weeks to be able to be able to play a match every three days in an emotional scenario that is difficult to understand that no one has ever seen before. It's also, it's not just about playing behind closed doors, it's so we will need that best conditions. He said there is a precedent in the NFL from 2011 where there was a suspension for three months because of a working problem and that led to 12 ruptured Achilles tendons in the first month of competition back when they had five back when they had the five the whole season so this kind of goes back to the point if anyone that's you know trained or anyone that's like played five-a-side football um you know you would know that there's a big difference between playing that kind of football in a five-a-side right uh power league whatever maybe taking that to 11 aside and taking that to doing that every saturday every weekend right it's a whole completely different ball game. Even if you're somebody that's you, you think you're physically fit, you run a lot, you go to the gym, that actual performing or playing to that level against an opponent that's also trying to beat you, it's just a whole different ball game of fitness. And it doesn't, you know, no amount of training on the treadmill, no amount of running in the street, no amount of push ups or, you know, home gym work and stuff is ever going to replicate that. So to get the players back to the necessary, just you know baseline level of fitness or performance which isn't you know again they're still gonna need a few games to get quote-unquote warmed up it's gonna take five weeks then on top of what level tech is saying there's no guarantee that you're not gonna have just a whole bunch of injuries you know spread across the entire league especially to some of the better players who might then affect the way the league shakes up and finishes because if anyone thinks you know the league is happy with certain teams winning it you'd be dumb in it right they want certain teams to get the top four they want certain teams to win it because it looks good for the image overall um, they can't really do anything if Sheffield United, if Sheffield United end up winning the league. It's not really the best, you know, scenario for the Premier League really in terms of uh, promoting it um, to a global audience. Let's say, obviously for us fans, it'd be fucking sick to see a team that small do something like that. But for everybody else, they don't 
it's not something they want to see so I think it's obviously going to do more damage than good you know having some of your top players out because you decided to have them play you know three games I mean what did it say uh, three games every five days or something or play a match every three days it's just insane and the bit you mentioned here too which I didn't actually come which I didn't actually think about was the emotional scenario of it you know how players are when they some of them when they come back and a member of their family passed away or they were you know involved in a really i don't know crucial game even just a week before like imagine during a week you had a cup game that you lost some players that tend to carry that that ill feeling um roll it over into some of the next games like there's loads of things that happen just day to day have an argument with your missus and you had to play a match imagine spending you know the best part of two months at home locked in confined and then hearing about your teammates relatives who are passed away in their homeland and all these stories you're hearing and then being suddenly told hey snap out of it you gotta go and perform and play in front of nobody in a state you don't recognize you know with this whole new procedures you have to go through it just it doesn't make any sense so i can't really see them it got it happening that way because you know the brands and sponsors won't be happy either when some of their best clients get pulled up you know pull up in the first couple of minutes of playing the game and they don't have a way to earn money right on that side as well so it's a real real horror show for everybody involved and again if there was a way to do this in a in a, a way that made sense i think they would have done it anyway i just like i said i think with like Aaron Edwards and Sunny, i just think the premier league are afraid to make a decision they're afraid to look ridiculous they don't want to um they don't want to come and blow up in their face so they're just waiting for the government to make a decision for them the government will probably say you know hey no events nothing big until this certain date and then they'll decide hey by the way we can't do anything either and put their hands up in defeat but it would be great to get a Premier League to make a decision so that players could you know have some peace of mind managers and teams and owners could then make some plans for the next season make the necessary adjustments whatever it may be that's what they should be doing but I have heard a theory that the reason why they're delaying so much is there's also a clause in their contracts or an obligation for them to explore every single avenue every single avenue or scenario try and see if it can work and then if you've got a cancer avoid you got to do it and also it might just be a waiting game it's, you know they might have a clause in the contract where they can't necessarily avoid or cancel the season it has to come from the government right they have to mandate something and then because it affects you you don't have to pull out and then that way you don't have to maybe pay a fine or whatever punny charge i don't know but regardless it's going to be interesting to see how this kind of shakes out in the next few weeks because there's going to be some tough decisions to be made for all involved especially the teams that help the ones that really going to the ones that are really going to struggle the teams that are like battling for promotion or battling to stay up that's going to be really difficult how they deal with that how they decide what happens like because i think the dutch league are going through that aren't they right where they avoided the season but they still are honoring the teams that promoted or the teams that were in the promotion places that's where it gets dodgy i think you just have to start the season again like that's it you just avoid this one you used to begin it how this one started there's no way you can really you know if the team's in the playoff spaces but there's no guarantee you know they've got just as much as right to go up into the next league as opposed to people that got the guaranteed space isn't it because that's how it works out so again i don't envy that decision to make man that's a tough one really a real tough one let's move on so what do we have here next we've got boris baby timing bad in it really do you give a shit i know i don't um it's a it's a weird one isn't it i'm not too sure if you'd want to even announce this if that was you knowing what's happening in the country and what's going on and how it would be received um but you might do that thing that a lot of politicians do where they just ignore what's happening in it they just kind of act like it's not really a thing it's not a situation um but yeah i guess congratulations to him this is a news from bbc he says boris johnson and carrie simmons and it's both of his son um which which might be interesting news because i wonder what they did in terms of him suffering from it did he have to kind of quarantine himself away from his family i'm assuming he did right he's got probably the top physicians assisting him in that regard so you know there was probably no danger of anything happening to the kid which is great news but just how it's how this is all shaking out for him it's been really interesting to see like you know his lack of leadership lack of leadership in this you know clear leadership i'd say i think he's been he's done all right so far but just some bits are a bit you know muddy but this article says the prime minister boris johnson the the fiance carrie simmons have announced the birth of their son a spokeswoman for the pm and his partner said both mother and baby are doing well 
It's understood Miss Johnson, who has recovered from uh, coronavirus, was present throughout the birth as NHS over to in London. But he has now returned to working down the street, Tamton said, where he's leading the response to the pandemic. Of course, they had to put that in there. Um, he is expected to take a short period of maternity leave at some point later this year, Down as you said. A couple have received measures of clarification across the political spectrum. And Mr. Johnson's father, Stanley, said he was absolutely delighted and thrilled by the birth of his grandson. Down the street declined to comment. Uh, declined to say whether the baby was born prematurely and did not provide the other the weight, timing, nature, and location as they shouldn't. In it, some of the questions people these ask him, I was like, How, what, Is that your business? The PM and Miss Simmons would like to find the uh, 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 so yeah, worrying week into Mr. Johnson 55 and Miss Simmons 32. Fair enough, and they did well there. Announced in March that they were expecting a baby in early September, early summer, sorry. And they had become engaged at the end of the last year. They're the first unmarried couple to move into Down Street together. The baby is Mr. Simmons' first child, while Miss Johnson is known to have fathered five. <laughs> Why are they putting his details in there? Try to make him sound like a bad dude. Um, the family are planning to continue living in, in a flat above number 11 Down Street. It's understood their dog didn't. Uh, this is a nonsense news. But yeah, what can you do? He's, They've got a baby. Um, the country is on the brink of collapse. And, you know, what can you do? Is what it is. Move on. That was shaming work. This is regard. This is regarding Jamil Hill, right? Yes. Yeah, so this is an interesting one. So Jamil Hill, former ASPN what pundit correspondent, um, she went really hard in the paint for Ken. Uh, what's his name? Colin Kaepernick, which eventually cost her a job. You know. Yes, those kind of big companies at ESPN just don't want the drama. I think what we saw with Colin Kaepernick was just an avoidance of drama, an avoidance of spectacle, an avoidance of unnecessary headlines, especially the NFL. I don't necessarily blame them because they have enough bad headlines as it, as it is, right? With players, you know, getting convicted of domestic violence, DUIs, fighting in the street, killing people. You know, there's a whole plethora of issues that come out of the NFL. So the last thing they need is, you know, somebody uh, declaring their civil rights or somebody, you know, discovering or walking into their civil rights moment. They just don't want that kind of smoke, unfortunately. Um, Because, you know, by all accounts, Colin Kaepernick is still able to play at that level. He still has a lot to give. um, And they made a call that had more to do with the fact that he was bad press and bad PR for the overall um, league as opposed to his actual skill on the field, which is disappointing because a lot of the people that are not, that are kind of convicted of, you know, let's say uh, domestic violence, abuse, whatever it may be, or, you know, maybe have gambling problems or whatever it is usually the rationale is that oh they do the job on the field right so that they don't give a shit what they do outside with even Colin Kaepernick the stuff that he does outside of his football career or maybe the fact that he was kneeling I don't know has really damaged his purpose of getting back but obviously this whole you know council culture thing has sort of died down with the pandemic happening and maybe rightly so, people have other things to concentrate on, and may, or maybe just the conversation has evolved somewhat into something of into a conversation where is there some kind of room or is there some kind of place where we can get to where people can maybe re, can get rehabilitated as opposed to getting cancelled outright? Because part of the way, part of some people's rationale behind cancelling is that it's a good way to teach somebody. Because if you take everything away from them that they love and they value or the stuff that they've been told they should value um, because of the core of public opinion, then they might then see the error of their ways and be like, you know what, I fucked up, I'm not going to do that again. But there's part of me that's like, I don't understand why somebody that harbors, you know, prejudice thoughts on a certain group of people would suddenly have their mind turned or be convinced what they're doing is wrong because you took everything from them and you know put them in a position where they're having to i don't know beg plead and borrow for money or to put food on the table i don't see how they're going to be compliant or agreeable in any way shape or form or ready to do any kind of do it just doesn't make any sense it doesn't really work out in my head too well and i just don't think it works it's not an effective measure to get people re- to, to get people to agree with your side or to change their ways it's just not going to happen but Jamil Hill and these kind of people have a tendency to do all the time and this is just pretty interesting because it's pretty layered so this is from um, Black Enterprise so Jamil Hill calls our New England Patriots draft pick for tattoo linked to white supremacy and this is the following sports commentator and contributor Jamil Hill has issue with New England Patriots and recent 
draft pick who sports a white supremacist tattoo, according to BET. This past weekend, during the National Football League annual draft, the New England Patriots selected kicker Justin Rowasa in the fifth round. The New York native was the tattoo of the logo for the Free Percenters, a far-right militia movement and paramilitary group that primarily advocates for gun ownerships and rights, limiting the federal government involvement in local affairs, which, to be honest, sounds pretty decent, isn't it? I don't really see how that's white supremacist. Again, it might be one of those things about bikers. You know, bikers don't, you know, certain bike gangs don't allow people from a different ethnic groups to join them, right? And then then you have other bike gangs that don't allow other ethnic groups to join them. So is there some, there's some kind of level playing field there, right? There's, you know, biker gangs that have any black people in it, Mexicans, whites, whatever, right? Everyone's got their thing, cool, whatever. You're all doing this whole racism thing to each other. That's fair. Then these paramilitary groups that advocate gun ownership and the ones that I'm assuming they do that whole open carry thing and Second Amendment people, right? I don't necessarily look at them as white supremacists. They might be a little bit, you know, neoliberal or not even neoliberal. They might they might kind of skirt on the side of, you know, America first, right? Populism in that regard, but you wouldn't necessarily think they're racist, right? It's that that's the right the conversation gets weird, like is it a racist thing to advocate for the rights of your fellow countrymen not really can it go there probably but i don't necessarily think throwing out those kind of accusations of people is the right way to start conversations because that could just be a question that he might because he could legitimately through a conversation you could legitimately find out if somebody has that tattoo through ill intent or just through something that they just you know grew up with in their hometown or whatever it may be there might just be something that they just a part of through friends and family i don't know people get titles of anything these days right it doesn't necessarily mean what they get the title of they 100 percent believe in so i think there could have been opportunity to start the conversation off with a far better footing they're just going straight for the racism and the white supremacist point of view because that does nothing and again what does it do if if this guy what does it prove that they nfl decided to draft this dude and not give you know colin kaepernick a job it just shows that you know again it's what we all have kind of understood this whole debacle colin kaepernick is not in the league because he doesn't know how to throw a football he's not in the league because he's just gonna bring too much drama that's what the it's just what the owners think right so then picking this dude who just has a tail on his arm and says not a word isn't a that big it's not a big a big, bigger surprise so i'm surprised that jimmy hill getting annoyed by it um it's just said the following here he says um he claims this guy i'm sorry, I mean, that he received the tattoo as a teenager and didn't know the time the logo stood for and has plans now to cover it which is you know a little bit questionable the fact that he's gone throughout his whole life and no one's ever kind of pointed out to him that might look to a different way again it can, it can happen you know what i mean P- people can have maybe he maybe he's got friends around him that are from the same ilk i don't know and again i think if that was something that he really truly believed in and he went to down that hill wouldn't he kind of fight for his but then maybe not because if you've just been drafted into the nfl right suddenly your life has changed for yourself and your family and you've got the prospect of you know securing the futures of your family's family right if you've got a young family that you've just you know you recently married you recently had a kid you're not necessarily going to turn around and you know fight for the right to keep these little free lines on your arm are you really it's not really a thing you're going to do so there is maybe an aspect of like of course he's going to reject it and say it's a teenage prank or something i did when i was younger but maybe he, he does still harbor those thoughts but that's the whole point if he does harbor those thoughts still you have to have a conversation you have to talk about it you can't just be telling somebody to get it covered that doesn't do anything right you can tell me not to wear my fucking ku klux klan outfit out in the street and i just don't wear it out in the street but i still got it at home that doesn't mean i've stopped thinking those thoughts so I think sometimes I don't know why they like to do this the counterculture lot they'd like to just like go and just get a person off done get them deleted get them get can get them cancelled but they don't want to they don't want to live in a world where that person can redeem themselves and come back off the other side and be like you know what I was wild in that time and I was going crazy I don't know what I was thinking now I've had this education now I've turned to these people I've been exposed to this kind of you know way of living. Um, I've seen things a different different point of view, bloody blah, blah blah blah. There's no op- convers- there's no opportunity for that when you just cancel someone straight out. But it continues here, it says um uh local suit for he said obviously it, it wasn't something that I don't want to represent and when I look back at it, okay that's so it's evolved. So I said I should have done more and more research before I put my mark on my body. 
uh, he said to ESPN to USA Today so it's not something I ever want to represent so it will be covered so I don't know why he just didn't cover it before but anyway uh, Russell told reporters on a conference call that he will never that he will cover the logo which has Roman numerals surrounded by the stars Russell claimed that he believed the organization for support use registry and got to his doing he wishes that he'd done research and Jamil Hill here says here Patriots kicker is a white supremacist my bad he tends to like white supremacist things carry on nothing to see here Oh God Almighty! A thread, okay. Of him liking what? Let's let's see what this thread says about him, because I think the those threads are always the most incriminating things, and then when they go through all your likes, but again, it is is it like a is it like a is it like a illustration of your endorsements, or is it just you just liking shit? I don't know, but let's check it out what he's actually liking. I might make him in more trouble than what he's worth. So, in the post-2016, Justin is playing. And, but then again, this this ain't really going to prove anything because he does admit in the passage that he did think he stood for something else. So, maybe him liking the things that he's liking is just him being younger. I don't know, but let's see. It says 2016, Justin is playing his uh, 3% logo along with a tattoo with live, di- live, or, live or Die Black Polo. What's wrong with live or die? And it continues here. More pics of Justin with the three percent of tattoo. So that's him with the tattoo on his arm. Showing it not showing it off, but it's on his arm. What can he do? Yeah. I don't think that's a big deal really, that one, but hey. He's got a tattoo on his arm, he's hanging out, he's doing his thing. Then two thousand eighteen, where I supposed to pick up himself as one of Santa's ho hos wearing an elf dress. The three percent of tattoo is visible. Well, what's this have to do with anything though? Justin Washington recommends Jordan Peterson. Oh, okay, now they're being stupid. Because he recommends Jordan Peterson and Jonathan Haidt that he's a bad dude. Nah. I've got Jordan Peterson book on my shelf. I've got Jonathan Haidt book on my shelf. Does that make me a white supremacist as well? This is insane. I've got an Iron, Iron Man book as well somewhere around here. Um, Virtues of Selfishness, I think I've got something. This is just insane. And then Iron Rand are both cons- con- no, they're not con- they're not right wing. Well, Iron Rand may be small, so Jordan Peterson no. Jordan Peterson teaches white privilege doesn't exist. Male privilege doesn't exist. Against <laughs> this is in- really simple oversimplification of his point of view, but whatever. And it continues here. Recent Instagram, he posted one day I'll be lucky enough to do this for a living, which is what presentation on Jordan Peterson. This is insane. This is what they're pro- arguing about. He liked and retweeted Trump, which is what's wrong with that. This is just insane. Joe Rogan, he likes Joe Rogan. The tweet complaining about gender neutral Santa dismissing an okay sign. Bloody hell. Okay, so I guess they just don't like him because he he's on the side of everyone else on social. We've some Candace Owen tweets on here too that people are not fans of. So Stephen Crowder, all the usual suspects people are not giving us so a Dennis D'Souza. Oh, okay. That's the problem with the left, isn't it? Like, how. If you're gonna bash this guy for his tattoo, that might have some, you know, questionable um, meaning or questionable representation. It might, you know, it's not maybe a good look for an athlete to rep- to be supporting a paramilitary group in any way, shape, or form. Anyway, that could be argued. Fair enough, right? Especially, you know, with brands and not being aligned with guns and shit. I get it. But to dig up his past and look at the stuff that he was watching in college and the, you know, uh, psychologists that he he follows, the public intellectuals he follows, people that commentate on YouTube, it's just not the right way to go about things. Because again, you're getting away from the point. Because he could just be as much looking at those guys as these people on the left, right? He just be, wants to see a balanced point of view, like people in the US or CNN and Fox News to understand what's actually happening in the world. Because both of them occupy different spectrums of the political, social um, spectrum, whatever it may be. So he, maybe he's doing that. So Nate, it, it's just it's just a really weird way to try and convince somebody what they're doing is wrong. Because he's going to cover up the tattoo and start playing again. But if he's harbored any ill will uh, towards a sem- certain segment of the population, why would it suddenly disappear because his tattoo is covered? It just doesn't make any sense, really. It's a really bizarre way to look at things, but you know, again, I think, um, and again, Jamil Hill's whole job, she lost her job off the back of this, right? She really went to down that, come, you know, kind of calling Kaepernick a uh, heel, and it goes to show how lucrative it is because she had a steady job working at ESPN, you know, 
um, it's a very lucrative job, a job that people, a lot of people would want. And then she decides to, well, she didn't, she just, no, I wouldn't say she decides to fire herself, but she puts up a position where somebody would be, somebody wouldn't be remiss to get, let her go because of all the drama that was associated with it. And again, some of the points I agree with, I think she was ultimately treated quite badly by ESPN, but there is a way to kind of like do your activism and still kind of keep a job I'd imagine <laughs> but I guess if you're a true activist you would probably want to be a bit punk about it and really flip tables and you know make everyone's life un- make everyone's life as uncomfortable as it can so you can get your point across right so you can kind of serve your purposes fine no problem but I'm f- thinking to myself her willingness to do so maybe shows that on the other side there is a lot more money there's a lot more notoriety maybe that's what a lot of them want it's not even the money it's maybe just the notoriety you want to be regarded as somebody that fought for you know fought for something apart from just you know commentating on stuff on tv and shit right you want to stand for more you want to be more most of them are like that right they don't they don't just they don't just accepting of being pretty and hosting a tv show they want people to think of them as virtuous warriors in this social justice fight i'd assume so um again i don't know but i just think it's a real bad way to number one a get your point across number two b try and convince somebody that maybe what they're thinking or their point of view is potentially wrong i don't necessarily think so right because again if he got a, a tattoo of pepe the frog on his arm what does that mean if, if imagine if he's just a troll like i don't know it's just some of these things they are just put there just to you know wind up a certain population some segment of the population and it does a really good job of doing it but then it also destroys people's lives isn't it because what do they want they want this guy to lose his nfl career before he's even kicked a ball because he decided to get a tattoo when he was younger that he represented with and he thought he ascribed it and i changed his mind I'm like come on he's got maps of feet on his side too isn't it there's other people on the other side who are going to be affected by this whole council thing that have nothing to do with it it's just the lack of compassion is really really frightening i think in that respect man that's the thing that only bugs me about all of this especially if he's the one that's being a douche just go towards him why do you have to kind of you know i don't know i don't know but anyway let's continue here let's get something else i thought was interesting maybe lighten the mood a bit um oh an audio rave this is an interesting development from the festival in italy it looks like which i thought was pretty cool and i think something that i would I've done already in the past, but I can't necessarily find a clip. I remember the first time I went to Fold, actually, I made a little audio recording um, about my experience. I recorded, I think, in the toilet, taking a shit, right, this is during the time I was in there. But I lost it. I don't know where the audio recording is, but I did, like, a little field recording where I, like, kind of record a voice memo of me in a dance floor, which sounded horrendous, of course, cause I'm just recording it from my iPhone. And I went to the toilet and I recorded a kind of you know an audio essay about my experience and how it was and how amazing i thought it the whole thing was i can't find the original clip i hope i can find if i can i'll try and include it into the um, audio version of the podcast here to listen to but this company or this brand or festival did something similar and i think it could be a good way to of course number one promote the thing that you're putting on um and also an alternative way to to market because i'm because i'm listening to one at the moment with electronic beats these sort of like video essays are split into different parts the um, first part was about you know finding um themselves uh within the whole techno music landscape and the second part was really informative because it spoke about you know this idea of knowing when to kind of leave the party and when to maybe it's enough and don't kind of the adage of like don't forget to go home sort of thing and i thought it was really well, well done but this is from um resident advisor um it's about their whole like coronavirus ep- uh, update somewhere down here yeah this is it so this is milan's um Milan Santo San Saturnalia Saturnalia Festival, which takes place annually at Macau, isn't happening in twenty twenty. The team has produced an audio documentary of the twenty eighteen edition available now at the band camp. And I just clicked and I thought it was really cool, man, what they're doing here. Um so this is from this festival called Saturnalia 2018 and this is the following um the audio documentary we recorded live at Center at the Saturnalia Collective um, so recorded live by some collective member, sorry, Luca Muki, aka Pizio, during the 2018 edition of the festival. That year, the collective had been experimenting with a new format, structuring the festival as a 30 hour continuous experience rather than scattering it throughout several days. Muki tasked himself with documenting the whole thing using a particular technique of field recording in ear by bi- bi- annual microphones to parallel the immersive 
gestal of the festival itself his own body his own ears and perceptions function as a probe setting the equipment to capture an auditory image of the event as similar as possible to the one ensnared by his own hearing morning to morning recording every bit in peace while traveling the festivals wandering through macau's halls um through the mostly compound of sounds that made a certain idea up uh, with the constant ever throbbing presence of bass frequency to remind of the festivals peddling to desiring bodies uh, even though what's being presented here is my idea of the complete recording is being compiled in college order which is based the source of footsteps and conversations and more we are releasing this while our country as well as the rest of the world is in lockdown during the COVID-19 disease when this year is current, consequently being cancelled we offer the recording as a reminder of what has been and a start of imagination of what can make the future be so I thought this is pretty cool right so um, recorded on what equipment of Roland microphone headphone what is this actually I want to know what that extra equipment is I would like to get one of those but because I think that'd be a really cool way of doing an actual documentary of a festival getting some idea of a clip and putting it on the podcast especially just getting a little um, audio version of it as opposed to trying to record because most places the one that you're recording you people be uncomfortable being on video so that will probably be an actual good way of doing it okay this is what it is it's about 80 quid so you put that in your ears and then what my headphones and all what is there a little microphone that you clip into or is a microphone kind of built into the headphones itself and then you play that back on another thing maybe i'm not too sure but you can play a little bit of the thing now actually and hear what they had to say i'm assuming it's gonna be lots of background noise in it right? There's the footsteps. Of course, there's the attention headphones only. Mm. I think it was pretty cool, man. You can also hear the kind of distant sound of the night going on, right? Because that's always a really cool bit to kind of capture. It's hard to kind of get in video that kind of walk up towards where you're going maybe you jump out of the cab you're talking to your friends you drop something you're picking it up pop into the shop quickly to get one last little pre-drink whatever it may be um sort yourself out quink quink nice nudge and then as you're approaching it the kind of fuzz getting louder and louder as you kind of get approaching the door Of course, this is some of the inside. Yeah, of Fairly cool way of putting it together, but I recommend you check it out. Um, Saturn Alley 2018 is available now. Of course, to purchase on their website on Bandcamp. I'll link that in notes for you guys to see for yourself. But again, hopefully, someone does something similar with more festivals because some those after movies can be hard things to put together in retrospect, especially you have to get someone down to film it, edit it, make sure it kind of captures a vibe. Um, maybe a mix of these kind of events things will be really cool loads of little short edits you can upload them to maybe just some snapshots especially just on smartphones you don't need that much in there i think the polished roundup videos are good but you just need people just on the ground wherever they are people that are working in the back on the bar just taking these little videos and you just send them and put them in a collage and kind of weave a narrative together maybe having some sort of overlays of the sounds you have on video to kind of piece it together and that's a really cool way of doing things I would say maybe that's just an avenue there for somebody as a hustle to do in it to go to events and just offer your services, record loads of bits of video, and put it together in a nice little clip, a nice little montage, and then send it to the event and say, Hey, here it is. Um, use it at your will. If you are going to credit me, and the next time you might get brought in, you might get some tick free tickets next time. I don't know, whatever. And there's a real good way to make yourself useful in that way if you're that way inclined. Anyway, let's move on there. What else do we have to talk about? Do, 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 do. Let's talk about some shoes, maybe some. Yeah, cab, I buy do leader. Capital Jeans. Yeah, let's talk about that. There's a new update. They've got a lookbook that's available now at the moment, showcasing some of their the newer pieces of denim, which I thought was of interest. Um, and it got me thinking about the need to actually go to a physical store and see how these look and. You know, get a feel of the actual store itself as opposed to just buying them online blindly especially when a lot of the stuff is made uh you know some of the sizes vary 
a lot they use a lot of vintage most of it is vintage anyway or repurposed stuff so there's no real guarantee that the size on the label is the actual size of the denim and there is something about you know um, measurements getting lost in translation when you go and upload the money into web sort of measurement the tape measure this is from high it says capital drops is 50 catalog spring summer flare star which i guess is focusing on the flare jeans which have been big this season you know um cutting sort of like cutting through the hem or whatever is on the side of the jeans and adding a an extra panel to sort of make them more of a boot cut fit to help you wear bigger clunkier shoes i'd assume that's why they've become so popular because a lot of people were in combats um i know i was especially the summer gone by um they're just comfortable and they're easy to wear over like big clunky shoes like dr martin's or like easy 700s or um, triple s's and any uh, other assortment of big chunky shoes like etsy shoes that they put out as well so maybe that comes from an extension of that and sometimes even the jordan ones and stuff where you know they don't necessarily look the you don't necessarily want to show them off with just the high top with just the high top version of the shoe with just skinny jeans you might want to be able to kind of you know pop the jean under the tongue a bit and i don't know there's there's a reason why they've been a thing but mostly it probably has to do with the fact that people were in combats um but i also like the idea that maybe it actually started from capital making these um custom jeans with these amazing patchwork quilts done on them and then loads of kids seeing it online and just kind of replicating the idea and do them themselves but either way it's a big trend that's been kind of uh going full force for the best part of maybe i don't know plus two years it's been pretty crazy it hasn't really died out which has been quite cool but this is from capital high beats there's a following here capital dropped 50th um issue of its seasonal catalog the series of photos spotlighting some of the label's most notable pieces from spring summer 2020 collection pieces like the american jet inspired j-wave souvenir jacket a modular 6040 cross camera and rack and the smiley pieces are among some of the garments of the day. yeah okay so it's three dollars available now but i don't know there's part of me that would want to maybe submit like this then you'd want to kind of have an experience where you are able to see the item merchandise in the store that sort of has some sort of affinity synergy with it there is some sort of connection maybe philosophy maybe in terms of the people that actually own the brand they might be old school friends i don't know you want some reference some kind of anchor towards the stuff that you buy maybe just buying it blindly online isn't the same thing when you see vintage people going to find vintage shops in tokyo and they stumble across bits of capital it just has a different feel a different kind of you know attraction when you happen to like you know bow your head underneath some low ceiling somewhere in the in the middle of tokyo and find this amazing piece from capital a brand that you just heard of on the internet there's a different vibe towards it i'm not too sure if kids are having the same reaction towards it but i think i would have mostly just like a, a cool thing right you see any young kind of wearing it you just want to wear it yourself there's not much more there's no depth to it it's just whatever's trendy these could be a visa so people just buy it the same way which is unfortunate really but what can you do but the jeans themselves look pretty cool um if you're after that kind of look i'm a big fan of them how they put them together of course the patchworks are in you know intricate stuff i'm sure the details are amazing i'm sure the fabrics used are vintage or sourced from a place where you can't get that much of it so most of these are one of one i would assume so um it's just done really really fucking well man everything that they do but again i would like the ability to at least buy my first piece you know from there uh, actually be able to go to the store especially now post corona there could be an option to go to places like japan like tokyo and um, visit these kind of vintage shops and have the experience of actually buying it in hand meaning the people that make it having a reference to the people that maybe shop there week in week out i don't know there's something else about it i'm not sure how Cool. but again i like the idea that they're you know selling a book that reminds of the old school days when we used to buy look books or magazines and kind of flick through and find out what the next brand was big street style stars whatever i'll get the free gift that was attached with it loads of these things i thought were really cool back in the day man but people don't really do it too often anymore but yeah check it out if you're that way inclined spring summer flare 2020 let's move on this is of interest here oh do say palooza that's the one in it it's probably end on that one so this news kind of broke over the last couple of hours or maybe last couple of days actually broke on monday one of the co-founders of do say Palooza's, um was unfortunately accused of some heinous crimes uh <laughs> towards females 
the mainly the ones that attended his events and the fallout has been pretty catastrophic really you know it goes to show just how damaging um one singular event can be i'm always interested in that kind of thing right how damaging one singular action or a series of action can be to the wider community or to wider network of people especially those closest and nearest to you so he decides to do some scumbaggy stuff to girls you know coercing them into having sex and you know just generally being a bit of a creep and then it leads to his one of his friends who's attached with the Joe Budden podcast Rory having to de- sort of not defend him but essentially try and explain why he didn't pull him up sooner rather than later which kind of which kind of did serve for a very good conversation an hour-long conversation about the need for men to check each other but it also kind of was very illuminating to see the difference um in how people are treated depending on what scene they belong to right because for sure i'm sure within a dance music scene electronic music scene there is a lot of creeper behavior going on right i'm sure there are people out there taking advantage of young and impressionable girls or just people in general not even girls everyone's probably getting taken advantage of to some extent in the electronic music space but there's a part of me that is kind of proud that in electronic dance space especially most of the raves i go to i listen to a lot of hip-hop but i also mostly go to raves where they play dance music electronic music techno house disco and most of these places they try their best to uh put together or put forward an idea of having these things and safe spaces right where they have somebody at the door picking somebody deciding whether or not you get in or not even if you've got the money it's not guaranteed that you're gonna get in maybe the imagery they use and the promotion maybe the way that it's kind of shared online there are things that you can do ahead of time to kind of set the tone as to what is acceptable is acceptable on the dance floor and quite honestly like like an example i always make when i first went to Berghain and like an idiot i tried to fucking take a pinger on the dance floor and someone random dude just like tapping the shoulder aggressively he's like no, no no we don't do that here you have to use the rooms that everyone else uses right so I use the toilet everyone else does and i quickly found out like you know that as much as this as much as that law of the kind of place burger and especially has been uh perpetu- perpetu- perpetuated by the interwebs most of the policing in that space is done by the people that dance there every weekend right they're very cognitive very aware that they've got a good thing here and they don't want me this fucking you know random tourist to come in and fuck out for everybody right that's not the best way to go about things so they say no don't do that here go in the toilet where everyone else does it which is fair it's fine and everyone knows us to do but it sets a tone because then i when i go in there i told i told somebody else or i'm very cognitive of my environment and every time i've been there even i've not seen anyone being you know untold or uh overstepping the mark everyone's just really well behaved but you wouldn't consider the amount of people that are in the Berkheim for one right or most electronic music clubs don't get me wrong the more popular ones around little bushy and shortage you know it's a fucking free fall but for the most part the ones that are very much attached to the idea of like perpetuating this culture and this community you usually everyone's okay but then you flip on the other side and you go to these other events where you know there is this kind of promoter led thing where the guy is like selling tables or is you know maybe under the guise of being some sort of pied piper of the club night that's when the problems can arise because then it becomes more so about the cult of personality than it is about the people in there having a good time and unfortunately as well for producer producer because from the looks of it outside looking in they're probably one of the only parties that were especially hip hop ones in the states that look like they were actively trying to sprinkle some of that sort of like you know studio 54 you know paradise garage sort of like you know dancing vibe right people actually looked like they were having fun they had like a big room with like no tables ready for the most part people just on the dance floor quote unquote grinding dancing having a good time doing you know competitions on the stage it looked like they were trying to steer it away from the sort of like you know screw face standing on the wall thing to make it more something that harkened back to the good old days right or people actually went to you know hip-hop parties to actually you know not only to hook up with girls but to try and you know outdo each other in the dance floor and just have a good time and sweat through their t-shirts and shit but um this is sort of you know 
maybe again it's not like a bad mark on anyone associated with it because you know only the person that did the crime should be punished in his respect i don't really i don't really agree with the whole sweeping cancellation thing but it's just such an unfortunate event for everyone involved for the girls that have to be subjected towards it to that kind of behavior and they have to relive it to the guy himself you just want to back off securing a deal with Giuseppe loser you'd think he'd try and maybe take his foot off the pedal and not be so creepy but you know sometimes people are just built a different way i think i've noticed that a lot with people that i used to hang around with, i used to go out with sometimes uh you know like some people just have a different they're just always on right they just can't turn it off that bit of them they can't be in a position where especially if you're putting on an event i think if you're maybe going out it's maybe different you know you're just trying to spread your seed quote unquote like a better term you're trying to get some attention from someone out there but when you put on an event i don't know i've put on many club nights i did this in places the last thing you're thinking about is talking up with somebody right you're trying to remember if you've still got that track in the folder you're trying to make sure the person that's meant to pay you is there you're worried about a million different things as opposed to who looks hot or what you might notice something but that's far from your mind so to be that you know calculative or manipulative about your actions is really really unfortunate so let's see the actual story and read what was said here but um this is the one i think this is what started everything right this tweet from this lady i think on a monday that started the whole affair um bu- 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 says yeah it's a very rapey n-word on here everyone laughs with and supports his events i'm sitting waiting for the day someone <laughs> pause his card i'm going to say this much person continues right um exposure is amazing but people will berate you to the point it's unbearable i don't need any stress right now i'm already on the edge i don't know other women who can tell their story i'm not physically assaulted but the situation was enough to make anyone who's heard the story okay this is pushy and too much and i'm grateful smart enough to remove myself before lines are blurred but yeah a lot of y'all support the boy so i'm not even gonna go there and that again is one of the issues i think with a lot of these events especially the ones that like you know led by the promoter and they kind of pushed in that way um if you're going to be if you're going to market your event as a place where women can come and dance have a good time and feel safe you have to follow through you can't then be trying to holler at these people trying to you know get sexual favors from them or just trying to blur the lines point blank if you want to be the place where people you know work it with somebody in, in you know the world work it visions had that kind of reputation where you know maybe because you know the actual founders of that club night were girls themselves and they were very plugged into that whole kind of going out girl scene um there was maybe a bit more trust there but there was the idea or the word around town was that if you went to hook up or you went to meet new girls you'd go to this event um but most of it most of that kind of uh most of these kind of events unless they uh, again if they're led by men they're usually going to attract not the kind of guys that other girls would want to be into either but again from what i saw from the outside again i'm living under i don't know what's going on it did look like they were the kind of people that seemed like they could have a whole group of girls just chilling having a good it looked like an extension of you know after hours people have you know when you're at a club somewhere and you'll go back to someone's house it doesn't necessarily mean because there's five girls and five boys you're all gonna hook up with each other it could just be a vibe in it they could just feel comfortable because um, i would imagine girls have a way they have a far longer checklist as to where and when they're willing to accept to go to people's houses than boys do boys probably you know if you've long as that person's got a fucking wi-fi connection they'd go and hang out in their house but girls probably have a lot more a lot more uh they have a lot more rules as to where they accept to go so if you are in a position where they're willing to hang out with you after hours you can't exploit that and take advantage of it you sort of got to be a gentleman in that regard and if anything you got to put yourself in a position where you're the one protecting them from untoward advances right you can't be the one be doing the creeping you've got to stop it to some and again how can you stop it if you're the one doing it it's just a very bizarre thing to do and also if you're putting on an event you should have some level of cloud that would allow you access to the people that you're hollering at especially in a less confrontational um creepo you know manipulative manner you should be able to secure some of their some of these women somehow right just off the strength of you doing the event because i'm sure there's some girls that don't mind hooking up with somebody that has some sort of notoriety they do exist out there but the ones that don't want to and just want to just be around and catch a vibe let them catch a vibe because again i think listen to driven podcast i think a lot of them put too much 
emphasis on dudes pulling up other dudes i don't think that's fair because again it's not your issue and again how would you know a lot of guys that when they do their flagrant stuff they don't do it in front of people that they respect or that they know because they know what they're doing is wrong but they need to be told point blank maybe by someone like you know maybe through interpretation maybe through events or seeing other people how they move that what they're doing is just too much it really is Especially when you're the one promoting this idea that you know it's a safe space for girls, and then you're put in a position where they're having to keep these secrets about you. It's just really weird. And then another one here. What are you saying? This is another one. This is another thing. Oh, said here. What's this clip there? He says, "Yeah, I must. This is a. This is what buried him, right? This is. I'm. I'm gonna speak on uh, my story one time." <laughs> Okay, it says here's my story and I don't give a F what y'all got to say about it. I'm really curious about the confrontational nature of these whole accusations or these explanations of these stories. Why are these girls like being so confrontational? Is it because this guy is so well liked and regarded that people would what say the girl's a liar or something? I don't understand why she's saying I don't give a F what y'all say. What is it? Because some dudes just won't believe you. That's the question. That's the worrying part about it. Like they build a brand up that girls don't feel comfortable saying their truth about the event because they feel like the community is going to reject them or shun them. That's not the way it should be, in it. Oh, bloody hell. Anyway, said so the night in question, he picked me up in my home girl to go to a bar and club in Lower, Lower East Side. So this is just a general thing. This is not even okay. This is what makes it more scummy because I guess it's just a general thing that he does. It's not even a thing to tie to the event where you can blame your, you blame it on the, you know on the alcohol or whatever it may be it's just you plotting to do this stuff so my girl is drunk but does want to but does want to leave me but doesn't want to do, but doesn't want to leave me and ruin the night i insist on calling her an uber home she asks me if i if i'm comfortable being a, just left with him i say he's taken me home before and it should be fine we put her in a the car then it's just us and he leaves me alone in the bar for like an hour by, by myself which I guess isn't that big of a deal. I guess if you're going to be with somebody, you would try and be a gentleman about it and, you know, make sure she's okay and, I don't know, hang out with the person after their friends left. You would probably do that, right? But again, listen, that's not the biggest deal, I would say. But hey, let's continue. He appears he appears offering me some juice. Oh, this is a questioning part of it because you didn't ask for a drink and he's just here for an hour. What was he put in it? That's where it gets risky. So I drink it, but I decline the second round offer. He then asks if I'm ready to go home. We get in the car, and he's immediately, and he's immediately on twelve, which is I guess turned up, right? He's kissing me, trying to pull out uh, my clothes, trying to get me to give him head while he's driving. I say, "Come on, man, just kiss it." He says, "Oh, Jesus Christ!" Anytime you say, "Come on, man." It's just really bad. He says, at the time, I'm still new to the city, so I can't really tell whether he's driving me until it dawned on me that we weren't headed to my house. Bloody hell. And it continues, the next one. I pull up to his place. I'm shocked, but, you know, blaming myself for possibly projecting mixed signals. This is really bad. We go inside. He kicks it up another notch, trying to take my jumpsuit off. He pulling at the knots of my top. And I said, my nigga, it took me, it took two people to get me into this outfit. I'm not taking this shit off for you. He gets upset and says, so are we not fucking tonight? And I say firmly, absolutely not. So he says, I bet and head back outside. I follow him thinking I'm finally being taken home. But he walks past his car, heading to the cross street. I follow trying to ease the tensions, having some more talk. He's basically ignoring me. Oh my God. We get to the corner, I ask him where we are going. He stops by, starts walking and says, this is Myrtle Avenue. I ask where we're going again and he just repeats this, Myrtle Avenue. I finally caught the hint. That man left me on a random street corner in the middle of Bulkley and at 3 a.m. at the nearest train station was a mile away. I was still new to NLC. I'm sure my story is paled in comparison with others. So she got away lightly, right? She didn't have to exchange any sexual favours. But being taken on that much of a roller coaster ride especially when you're because that's the thing that i think is bad about this because there is a conversation to be had about you know should men be responsible um should they cast should be should they be should they be should they have most of the burden carry most of the burden when it comes to these this this game of sexual attraction and unfortunately i think they do because most guys can't aren't mature enough to deal with these situations in a mature way they get a little bit infantile and when someone rejects them, they kind of, you know, immediately kind of tense up and become defensive and, you know, 
uh, confrontational or just being shitty humans like this because this is not a gentlemanly thing to do right if somebody declines your favors you should be gracious enough to take them back home or at least take them to the nearest station or don't know just be a gentleman just let them chill until the morning when their friends are up whatever there should be a way to kind of defuse the situation and it maybe that is the point that maybe that is the guy's responsibility because usually in those positions the kind of power positions the guy has probably more uh he's probably more of a threat to the girl as opposed to being the other way around so you're probably have the responsibility to make sure that that person feels that they're that it's okay that they said no and nothing else is going to happen if they want to go home they can you wouldn't want to get in the cab or they can get you whatever it may be you're more than willing to do that but this way it's just really really deep and again she's saying she got off lightly right he left her in the lurch like this and let's continue on and I think they've already cut ties with him anyway, innit? So I think he's already done for, you know, getting cancelled during lockdown is a mad one. But here's another one, which I probably assume is going to be worse because I haven't read any of these. But it's just strange. I just don't know why you'd want to do that, you know? Again, if you invite these girls to your events or you want to perpetuate this idea that you're somehow an event for girls to feel comfortable, like, why would you be this much of a creep? And it continues. Um, Elizabeth Taylor. She read this here. More messages with this sicko. Only black tile that address to protect people. Other people may also live there. It says yeah, better see you tonight. It says things up. What's your ID on the way? It says the the I look hella bummy. You judging me and we squaring up ETA thirty minutes. Okay, what's wrong with this? Continue. What time you get off? Eight thirty. Okay, see you then. I get off at eight thirty. Won't be back to be at nine. Then you got a wash, so maybe ten wash i'll wash when i get home after leaving you kind to eat and run my mouth <sighs> so already they're stating the, what the game is right coming to eat and run my mouth so they're just saying look i'm not coming to wash and fuck i'm just going to hang out you really got you you really gonna cook or you bullshit and said so you're really not gonna wash or you bullshit so i'm not going to shower when i get home i'm coming from work why would i stop home to do that i won't come back out you're gonna come around me smelling like a long day jesus christ why not talk to me if you never take it there and because something four years ago good morning to you too chris good morning why not why talk to me assuming as i was going to quick fuck you saw i wasn't and you threw me out of your crib so you're not going to ask my question i was never going to talk to you on the premise of fucking you i thought you were cool and i assumed we also would sort of be cool so let me get to your answer okay okay guess you don't have one jesus christ this guy man <sighs> the lack of game is quite frightening in it but it's also not surprising i guess think it kind of illustrates why or it kind of does it's a fair illustration as to why so many men were interested um doing those you know pua pickup seminars and conferences and stuff because most dudes just don't have any game none none devoid of it especially someone like this who's I'm assuming around people that do or you put in a position where you know you should be able to you know you should be able to attract women in your life that you want because you have access to them mostly right because i think that's usually the big stumbling block just being in a because i think most dudes would feel like they have a chance with somebody maybe a bit out of the league just as long as they get in the room but sometimes just being in a room is very difficult because you know people of high stature people of high value people that kind of view themselves highly regardless are going to put themselves in a position where they're not around common folk like you know it's just what it is and that's why most celebrities date other celebrities but when you're in a room you'd give yourself a fair enough chance because you know you think you have some level of swag some level of game some kind of character twerk or quirk whatever it may be that can attract somebody but then to do this just shows that you know number one you're not because that's an issue i have with this like if you're gonna do this you're gonna you're gonna maybe do it especially when most of these people are going to assume especially the girls are probably friends of friends or they're running the same circles or i don't know whatever especially the ones that live in new york you'd want to make sure your name isn't muddied in the streets right you'd want to do right by what even if it is got something you're just going to do as a quick hookup you want to make sure that you treat everyone nicely so that when your name is brought up it's not like you know people just chipping in and you know besmirching you and making saying the most ludicrous things behind closed doors it's someone that might have a bad experience with you don't get me wrong because people do have bad experiences but mostly everyone's sort of like got a good experience to say about you in general that's what you'd want especially when you're not in the room 
But I think that's the most important, isn't it? What people say behind closed doors, what people say in front of you isn't what really matters. It's what people say when you're not around. That really is a judge of your character. And of course, this dude recorded, then decides to get on the internet. And, you know, I do say police actually stepped in. They're the ones that sort of like pulled the plug on everything, which again is incredibly disappointing because not only did he damage his reputation, he also had his reputation as a brand. He kind of smudged everybody else. You have Rory on the podcast talking for an hour about something that he didn't do. It's just a really disappointing situation. And you have here Tuse Palooza's um, statement. We're aware the allegation made against one of our staff members. We're currently conducting an internal investigation around the allegation. Until the investigation has concluded, that staff member has been placed on his definite leave, which is imagine he probably had access to his account and now all of a sudden during the whole transition we do say it might have been turned over to an external in the social media team or they might have locked him out of it and now they're making these updates it's just a catastrophe man that catastrophe for everybody involved and with that said we've always made the safety of consumers and talent and stuff our top priority we pride ourselves in creating a safe space and enjoyable environment that will remain our focus for moving forward into the future shows and events after further considerations this year 22 hours we have decided to sever ties with a staff member who is currently who is initially put on under investigation under internal investigation the effect of immediately staff seven members no longer part of police as a team and we will not host any of our events going forward it's always been our goal to create and maintain an environment where everyone feels safe we admittedly reject we admittedly reject any instance where women are made to feel otherwise which is fair enough because i think a lot of the stuff that he was doing was just him being a creeper and everyone else is kind of piling in here this is feels kind of passive like i don't completely believe what's going on i think the internal investigation is okay i think even if he did suffer off for his hands you sh- he they should be allowed to investigate and see what's going on um why are you explaining what is this what's this broker check what the check what is this about i don't know what this this screenshot is about this is him previously registered broker if it was banned individual from acting as a broker otherwise associated as a broker i don't know what it's about but whatever um and then finally he decided to ill 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 advise explanation on video I think in this occasion, there's nothing really you can say in it. You did the shit. You just got to, like, take the L. Apologize to those people that's, that are involved. Don't even take the L. You've got to really look yourself in the mirror, innit? Really and truly. If you're going to do stuff like this in this kind of arena, especially knowing the access you have, knowing the people that depend on you, and just in general, innit? Just being a kind of a good dude. That's, again, that's what I go back to the whole taking up scene in dance culture and music. There are, we do have our problems, don't get me wrong, but this isn't necessarily a thing people aren't necessarily starting nights to use it as a kind of as a front to you know get close to attractive women they're using it as a front to maybe look cool to these women or to maybe look cool to certain dudes whatever it may be but it's not necessarily just the front to kind of get access to girls i mean that's what it looks like that this guy was effectively doing which is really really a bad way to go about things but his apology video is somewhere along here where is it then there's this clip here of him def- is it defending Cosby someone said I don't know if this is true but bloody hell it's a whole entire madness of situation again it's all alleged you know there's no I guess it's all she- you can you say he says he said not really because he, you know those accounts they're coming from multiple oh, women there's no really he says she said really in it you just, especially when I think when one or two stories come out you can maybe rationalise it some way there is maybe a way to explain it but when you have 10 plus people from all different places in the country or from different social groups saying the same thing about somebody it just is what it is and it? they're just a shitty human being um so this is a video from twitter someone said so he was what defending cosby what's this we put it like this bill car black biggest tv show no matter what race everybody was watching the kind of mm-hmm. millionaire times and times over Height of his career. A woman goes to a hotel with a married man. He fucked up by himself. He, I'm gonna tell you what he Why fucked is she up. going? I mean, she's I'm gonna tell you what he fucked up. She she imagine, imagine choosing the hill to down, and you want to choose to down the Bill Cosby hill. I don't think that's the one, and then some ill-advised what did he just did he did defend himself i think from it and he stepped in and made some videos but 
it's not is it worth even playing them now probably not regardless RIP that dude's career for the most part I guess it is what it is lessons are going to be learned maybe there is an opportunity maybe for some people to step in and provide that safe space for girls in that scene because I guess there is a need for those kind of parties right for girls within the hip hop scene to feel like they can come out look cute and not have you know not be worried that the person that invited them is going to try and fuck them in a car on the way home um, that is something to look so that's, some, that's a that's a kind of reasonable uh, hesitation to have so maybe someone can step in and make a rave that kind of case so that I don't know how you do it um, there is a way to do it I'm sure because it's been done before but uh, just yeah it's such a bad move man for all involved but again I'm glad they addressed it um, or the Joe the, Budden the podcast actually not, not him I think he's addressing it it was horrendous I think he tried to defend himself and say that he didn't rape anybody well that's not the point though, really isn't it that's not about the raping even if you did do that whatever it's about the scammy behavior in it like you can't just be leaving people in the streets at three in the morning because they don't want to put out that's just nuts isn't it especially when if you read the story it looks like she was given an indication that she didn't want to do anything from the beginning anyway so it's like yeah guys are scumbag in it what can you do anyway that is actually on show episode number three is three zero seven as per usual if you're the first time listening smash that like hit subscribe leave me a comment if you're listening via the podcast app of course five star review and share it with your friends more information regarding myself can be found in the link below that's actionzinger.com more links to my instagram and twitter make sure you follow me in there but until then see each other very very soon or we'll see each other very very soon not see each other see each other very very soon take care be safe bye